what is the relationship of this image to this image? It's an amazing story, and we're going to share it with you on Celebrating Aviation Art with Mike Machette. We have a very special episode tonight. What you see here is a painting of a brochure cover for Piper Aircraft that was done in 1950. This is the right half of a mural at the Air Force Flight Test Center Museum at Edwards Air Force Base. And this was painted in the year 2000. The span of time between 1950 and 2000 is what I refer to as the golden age of aviation art. Now, obviously aviation art existed really from the beginning of aviation, but here we see a World War II ad. But after 1950, it was an entirely new look. It was a style of illustration that had never been seen before. It was exciting, it was riveting, and it reflected the beginning of the Cold War. It was the beginning also of the commercial jet age. And we had Mach 2 jet fighters. Sometimes just the shape of the airplane would be compelling enough. You didn't even need to see the whole airplane. There were jet powered executive aircraft painted in a corporate environment. And uh, a special acknowledgement to the incredible artistry that came from Great Britain at that time with legendary artists uh, like Frank Wooten and the great John Young, whose work is seen here. In the year 2000, there was uh, new jet airliners that were flying in the color schemes of airplanes from the early 1950s. And the age old question, is aviation art fine art or is it commercial art? Well, the technical definition of fine art is artwork that is purchased after it's made. And commercial art is purchased before it's made. But there's a lot of gray area. For instance, here's my painting of the uh, approach and landing test for the Space Shuttle Enterprise in 1977. This is Free Flight 4. Here's a close up of the shuttle, close up of the uh, carrier 747 after the release. And the original is a part of the permanent collection of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. And this would make it fine art. But the painting was used on a book cover, it was also uh, created as a limited edition lithograph signed by both pilots, and that would make it commercial art. How many ways was aviation art used during the golden age? Well, let's take a look. First and foremost, there was advertising. This is a Lockheed 1649 con Constellation painted by the great Ren Wicks. Here's the same type of airplane painted by a European artist. Magazine covers were big. Uh, these are called high, high impact covers. They're designed specifically for the newsstand. They have to attract your attention in less than three seconds. So they use uh, bold graphics and uh, bright, bold covers, uh, colors and shapes and uh, that was the job of the magazine cover on the newsstand. For subscriptions only, it was uh, what they call low impact covers. These were delivered to your uh, mailbox. Or, and so there was no need for the uh, bright uh, graphics to attract your attention. And so these were called low impact, a different style for magazine covers of that era. Movie posters were uh, in a class by themselves and brochure covers for uh, the Capital Viscount Airliner in this case, or the Piper Cherokee uh, were uh, also uh, huge uh, for the use of aviation art. And of course, our beloved model kits, the box art on these models in the 1950s. Uh, I get many comments on the channel from people, uh, viewers who uh, recall their childhood memories and uh, it's very vivid, it goes very deep. These uh, images were just etched into our uh, minds at the time and uh, they recreated all the excitement and drama of flying in these airplanes in a space that was only five inches high by 12 inches long. It was riveting artwork. On the channel, uh, if you uh, look at our playlist under models, we have a number of videos on how box art was designed, the use of color, and so I have a link uh, in the title block below if you want to see some of those. Book covers were uh, huge, and these, these two covers are actual books I had as a young boy uh, back in the early 1950s, 
And this was my bedtime reading for years. Uh, I was just mesmerized by the imagery in these books, and I couldn't wait to become part of the industry. This uh, led to a 40-year career in aviation art and my own book, Painting Aviation's Legends, shameless plug. Uh, this book is available. Uh, it's a 10 by 10 hardbound, has 60 paintings, the stories of 30 pilots, full color, and Specialty Press has offered uh, the viewers of my channel a 25% discount. You can order it uh, on the link uh, below the title block, and the book will be delivered to your front door. But uh, book covers are bold and exciting graphics as well. We'll talk a little more in detail uh, in a few moments. Last but not least, the use of aviation art in the uh, industry, aerospace, uh, for proposal covers like this. And this is the plant in Long Beach in the uh, 1970s. It's the Douglas Aircraft Company division of McDonnell Douglas Corporation. And I'm going to uh, invite you into the corporate world uh, with some look, uh, some of the looks at uh, corporate aviation art and how it's made. Here's the product display center and shows examples of everything we did in presentations department. Uh, the big uh, MD-100 display in the background, paintings on the wall, decals for the models, you name it, we made it. So how does it work in a big corporate art department in terms of acquiring aviation art? Well, the general rule was you could have it good, fast, or cheap, pick any two. What that means is you could have it good and fast, but it wouldn't be cheap. You'd need budget for something like this. If you wanted it good and cheap, uh, we'll call you when it's ready. And if you want it fast and cheap, well, it's probably not gonna be very good. Now, the concept of working for deadlines began for me back in high school art class. I was blessed with a very advanced program, and this uh, led to my uh, college art experience as well, where uh, staying up late at night was the uh, given rule, and uh, working on uh, tight deadlines under pressure was uh, uh, kind of the main goal. So that became familiar territory, and we used it in the corporate world uh, almost on a daily basis. For instance, uh, this is an example of a project where I had to make a mock-up of a brochure cover uh, for a proposal for the DC-10 stretch. Uh, this would have been in 1979. And uh, my boss called me into the office at 1030 in the morning, and he said, look, uh, we need this uh, comp by uh, one o'clock for a staff meeting in the executive tower. So I knew I wasn't going to eat lunch, and I knew I wasn't going to be using oil paint. I got out my trusty Prismacolor pencils and got to work. Uh, banged this out in about two and a half hours. And uh, at about 10 minutes to one, I hand carried this up to the executive tower, mission accomplished. The finish uh, came uh, a few months later, and that's what you see here. Uh, the DC-10 uh, Super 60 series led to eventually the MD-11. But sometimes you could have it good, fast, and cheap, and that was the use of black and white artwork, which was very efficient for creating uh, good high-impact uh, uh, imagery uh, on a short uh, notice and, and quickly and efficiently. You could make a drawing like this in one to two hours. And the use of uh, pencil drawings printed in sepia for uh, mass reproductions of uh, company image uh, were also very efficient. This is a drawing by the great R.G. Smith, our chief artist. And it's a graphite pencil drawing. Uh, a drawing like this, R.G. could produce uh, if with one airplane. He could probably do it in one day. Our chief illustrator was George Akimoto, and he made uh, beautiful acrylic paintings of uh, company products. And during the DC-9 uh, Super 80 program, uh, Akimoto made this beautiful rendering. A project that I had on that airplane was the cutaway. This was a 30 by 40 gouache on illustration board project, and it had to be good. It didn't have to be fast. I had uh, uh, the project assigned in November. I had to the end of the year, 1980, to produce it. Uh, in 1981, in the beginning of the year, they were going to go out with all sorts of promotional material. So a uh, lot of love in this project. Uh, it was designed to show the new features of the Super 80. Here you see the cockpit, the forward uh, galley seating. Here's the aft galley with the uh, new aft door that was brand new on the Super 80, uh, the luggage area and lavatories. It was a wonderful project. Now you notice that I showed this uh, airplane banking towards you 
And this is called the airliner view. And I mentioned this because uh, there was a specific reason that we painted airliners like this. For any number of reasons, and especially in the corporate world, uh, it was important to be able to count the windows. Uh, there were different versions of airplanes. They had different window uh, lines, uh, different emergency exits. And so it was important to be able to see all the windows and the aircraft registration. Well, back to the book covers, let's talk about how these were designed and why. Uh, a number of ways to create uh, book covers, for instance, you could take an existing painting like this and adapt it to a book cover like this. Or you could produce what is called a spot illustration, and that would be integrated into the book cover. Or sometimes you just start from scratch and the art director would tell you exactly what he wanted. Now, in our business, the art director is the boss. He has final say. And I mention this because on Tom Blackburn's Corsair, the nose art and the title on the tail were only on the left side of the airplane. So for the uh, Corsair faithful, they're gonna look at this and think that uh, I didn't know what I was doing, but the art director insisted that the airplane being uh, uh, be shown flying to the right on the cover. And he wanted the nose art and the name on the right side of the airplane, his exact words to me were, change it. In some cases, a book cover or any type of job will be painted to completion, but it won't be used for any number of reasons. Uh, they could go with photography or different type of artwork. So this was a book cover for a book called The Ravens, showed an L-19 forward air controller in action, and uh, it never got to the cover, but I was paid what was called a kill fee. And this pays the artist fairly for the work that was done, but you don't uh, see any residuals or royalties from uh, mass distribution of the end product. Now, here's an interesting twist. Uh, I had mentioned Prismacolor pencil, and I produced a uh, very rough concept in Prismacolor, a comp image of a Fairchild advanced uh, transport project from the early 50s, and obviously never flew. And the uh, comp was done in uh, Photoshop. And this led to the final cover, uh, which was done by a digital artist uh, using my imagery as a source material. So you've got everything from hand-drawn sketches to a digital final book cover, and it runs the gamut in terms of how these covers are produced. Now, the biggest objective of a book cover is to be used and shown small. And that's today's requirement because most of the orders, whether you're ordering on Amazon, uh, you are doing it on an iPad or an iPhone. And so these covers have to be, uh, be able to be read at a small size. Magazine illustration back in the golden age was an entirely different uh, requirement and a different process. Here we see a beautiful uh, cover done by the great Roy Grinnell. And you notice that there's a lot of diagonal activity in the magazine and book covers uh, because diagonal uh, elements show action and excitement. For this magazine cover, I commissioned my dear friend, the late Craig Cadera, to paint uh, the North American F-108 Rapier in Edwards Air Force Base markings for a specific issue of Air Power magazine. And here you can see that the artwork was designed with plenty of open sky so that the uh, type and uh, inset photos could be used uh, it, like so. But what's interesting is as dynamic and as exciting as this whole cover was, and it was one of our top selling issues of the 62 issues I produced as editor in chief, what you see on a newsstand is this. Unless you pay extra, which is called retail dealer allowance for a really good placement all the way up to uh, the newsstand or the uh, checkout stand at your supermarket with the newspaper, the magazines up there. Unless you're going to do that, this is what you're going to see on a newsstand. And that's why you always see a banner at the top of a magazine. Now, speaking of deadlines, this was a project, really one for the books. Uh, Popular Mechanics uh, in 1996 had an X-Plane issue. I was commissioned to do the fabulous X-Plane poster. But the uh, trick here was that the uh, final image, which you see, uh, would normally have been about a, I want to say a six or eight day uh, project from the initial workups and into the uh, underpaintings and the final art, and then it would be shipped off to New York. However, in this particular case, the uh, final image uh, was concept sketch was signed off uh, by fax, if you remember what uh, those were, uh, on a Monday afternoon, and the finish was uh, due in New York on a Friday morning that same week. 
So I had uh, just less than 72 hours to do the whole project. And sometimes you have to just rise to the occasion. So it was two all-nighters. I uh, took naps while the paint was drying. It was a uh, screaming uh, panic project. Uh, lo and behold, at uh, 545 on Thursday, I was on my way to FedEx and uh, the uh, painting, which was 16 by 20 oil on masonite, arrived at the uh, art director's desk in New York uh, by 12 noon Friday. Mission accomplished. Sometimes uh, a client will know exactly what he wants. And this is a, a model. You've heard the term artist model. This is mine. Uh, it's the Sikorsky S43 baby clipper. And the client wanted a takeoff scene uh, left front three quarter from the waterline. So that model became this drawing. It's called the final detail drawing. Here's a close up. And this gives me all the information I need uh, when it's transferred to the canvas. I then uh, go ahead and fill in the colorization. And here's a detail of the painting. Relatively simple. It was about a, oh, about a four or five day project. And there's the finish, the launch of the S43, seagulls and all. But in other cases, the client wants to see an array of different ideas and then he'll select what he uh, wants as his favorite. So this is the uh, Air France Concorde. In 1998, I was commissioned for a series of uh, images for a round the world charter flight of the airplane in 1998 and 1999. So I presented the client with a series of drawings, uh, rough sketches. Uh, they wanted uh, Tahiti in the image because the airplane was gonna visit there. And so I showed uh, this view, I tried uh, this view, even uh, added an in-flight view just for variety. And they chose uh, this, a scene from the side of the runway. The title of the painting was Tahiti Takeoff. Uh, the Air France constellation is a little bit of nostalgia showing uh, Air France's service to the island in the 1950s. And no, there was no palm tree right next to the runway. Sometimes you get to uh, exercise your artistic license. Now, in an interesting twist, the in-flight rough sketch was adapted for another painting uh, on a charter flight uh, for New Year's Eve 2000, the uh, change of the millennium. And this is the airplane over Hong Kong. My compensation for this project was quite interesting. It was a small honorarium to cover the expenses and a barter for a flight in the airplane. And I got to sit in uh, seat 0A ride of a lifetime, Mach 2, 60,000 feet. And I'm gonna wrap up by talking about murals. This particular mural is at the Bob Hope Airport in Burbank, California, uh, in tribute to the Lockheed P-38 Lightning. Uh, the P-38 was built by Lockheed at Burbank. And so this uh, exhibit in the terminal building uh, pays tribute to that great airplane and all the wonderful people who were involved in its creation. So the essence of a mural is going from a 20 inch canvas to a 20 foot wall. It's painted in oils. And it's much like the difference between flying this airplane and flying this airplane. The fundamentals are the same. It's just much, much bigger. The objective for this mural, which was going to be at the Museum of Flying in Santa Monica, California, was to show all six major Douglas Navy aircraft built in El Segundo on the deck of the USS Forrestal on an actual cruise in September of 1958, the one and only time that that ever happened. So again, a concept sketch showing uh, the three jets on the deck and uh, the Sky Raiders would be up above. This evolved into a uh, comp sketch. Uh, I even thought of mixing in the F5D Sky Lancer and the Sky Knight, uh, but uh, those uh, never uh, were real carrier-based airplanes. So I went with the three Sky Raiders that you see here in the final drawing. It's gridded. Each grid uh, represents two square feet on the wall. And this will be the drawing used to scale up the final imagery. From that uh, comp, drawing uh, came a one-fifth scale painting, which was kind of a roadmap. It gave me the basic coloration, uh, not very detailed and, and pretty basic, but this gave me the very first step uh, in the uh, sequence to uh, translate all this imagery to wall size. Next step was to prepare the wall. It was again, uh, just about 10 feet high and just short of 20 feet long. You notice there's a gray electrical panel on the wall 
And I decided to integrate this into the painting. Uh, but uh, it was a six month project overall, about 600 hours total. And this is the line art on the wall, full size. And there I am up on the uh, lift, uh, putting in the basic color. And uh, I have models to use for reference and drawings. And there's the finish. The title is Fly Navy. And again, paying tribute to the Douglas aircraft built in El Segundo for the US Navy in the 1950s. The idea I had for this was to put the museum visitors in, in the catwalk of the carrier. So you're just at eye level with the flight deck. And uh, you remember that electrical panel I told you about? Well, at lower right, there it is as part of the ship. Fun project. So in summation, what uh, really took place in the latter half of the 20th century was artwork created with natural media. What you have today is imagery created with digital media. But in the 20th century, this artwork was the golden age of aviation art. So there you have it, the story of an amazing heyday of uh, aviation art in its prime. A special recognition and thanks to the great artists whose imagery you saw in this presentation. They represented the very best of the best. As well, the clients, institutions, uh, individuals who uh, supported the industry and made that artwork possible. Thank you for celebrating aviation art with Mike Machat. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, we'd appreciate having you on board. And uh, we are celebrating our 20,000th sub subscriber. In our next episode, we'll be uh, showing a retrospective uh, explaining how the channel came to be. So until then, take care.